then uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for everyone. Uh, we are very, very excited to open the last day of the first Suava meeting. We had about 300 attendants each day until now. Uh, for the ones who did not attend the previous presentation, the videos are in the WAVA's YouTube channel, and we have almost 2,000 views. And we will post the link in the chat of the YouTube uh, broadcast, then you can go to the link to, to see the videos for previ previous presentation. I'm sure today we will have also interesting and different approaches to handle the crisis we are going through. And so let's start with the first presentation. And now we are going to have uh, Dr. Francesco Francesco Abat from the University of Messina. He is the Associate Editor of the Anat Anatomia, Histologia, Embryologia. And then Franco. Okay. I'm ready. So hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, very much uh, Marco for uh, giving me this uh, absolutely uh, wonderful opportunity to participate to this uh, very interesting and now we can say without any doubt uh, uh, successful meeting. I will talk about uh, um, the situation. What was the situation in Italy? I will talk about uh, the teaching of veterinary anatomy during uh, the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, I put in the title uh, the term the Italian model. Um, as uh, perhaps you know, this term uh, was widely used uh, during uh, um, the worst period of pandemic in Europe because uh, Italy was uh, the first country interested by um, the COVID-19 uh, emergency immediately after China. For this reason, I um, would like to show you in, uh, in this uh, slide uh, on the left, uh, at the cover of the Wall Street Journal with a uh, picture of the Pope, uh, the Pope Bergoglio alone in St. Peter's Square, praying to the wall for the pandemic end. In the center, you can observe an image that for us is the symbol of the, that period, a nurse taking care of uh, Italy. And on the right, uh, the most terrible one, uh, you can observe uh, um, many trucks uh, carrying coffins uh, with hundreds of deaths uh, in Bergamo uh, during uh, the pandemic. Uh, in Italy, uh, there are, we can say there are over uh, 250,000 cases, and uh, we have uh, over 35,000 deaths. Uh, and uh, the situation, as you know, uh, everywhere in the world is in progress. So uh, about uh, um, the Italian modern, uh, the WHO uh, wrote on Twitter, uh, particularly the Director General Tedros Ghebreyesus, uh, in March, Italy and Spain were the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic. Both countries brought their COVID-19 epidemics under control with a combination of leadership, humility, active participation by, the, by every number of society, and implementing a comprehensive approach. Both countries faced a daunting situation, but turned it around. I hope that uh, it will happen also in the future. So what happened in the University of Messina? Uh, four days, only four days after the so-called uh, Passion Zero in Codogno, in the northern part of Italy, uh, the rector of the University of Messina on February 25th suspended the, the in-presence lectures. From that day on, lectures, exams, and degrees were online. Hey, Franco. Uh, yes? I, I, I just see your first slides. Only the first? Yeah, you are you are in the first slide yet. Okay. We, okay we, now? We cannot see the second and the third slides. 
Okay, Maybe. this was the second slide. I can repeat if you want. I think so, yeah. Please. Okay, so uh, excuse me for the technical problem. Um, okay. I, I said that we used the term, uh, the Italian model, uh, because uh, this term was widely used uh, all over uh, the world because Italy was uh, the first country interested by the pandemic immediately after China. And in this slide, uh, I put uh, the covers of uh, international and uh, Italian journals. Uh, particularly on the left, you can observe the Wall Street Journal, the cover of the Wall Street Journal, showing a picture of the Pope alone in St. Peter's Square, um, praying uh, to the world for the pandemic sand. In the center, we can observe a symbol, an image that is a symbol of that period with a nurse taking care of Italy. On the right, uh, uh, the most terrible one, perhaps, a uh, uh, photo um, with uh, numerous uh, tracks uh, carrying uh, hundreds of deaths during uh, the pandemic uh, in Bergamo. Uh, we, had, uh, we have over 250,000 cases uh, and uh, over 35,000 deaths. Uh, what happened? Uh, what happened uh, in uh, uh, um, what happened in Italy uh, was uh, described uh, by the WHO on Twitter, particularly uh, its Director General Tedros Ghebreyesus. Uh, he wrote in March, Italy and Spain were the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic. Both countries brought the COVID-19 epidemics under control with a combination of leadership. Humility, active participation by every member of society, and implementing a comprehensive approach. Both countries face a daunting situation, but turning it around. Uh, we hope that uh, it will happen also in the future. This will happen also in the future. So, what happened in the University of Messina? A um, few days after the so called Passion Zero, on February 25th, the director of the University of Messina suspended, the, immediately suspended the in present lectures. And from that day on, lectures, exams, and degrees uh, were only online. It's important to say that uh, in the first week of March, around the uh, 7, 8 of March, uh, all the departments were completely closed. From one day to the next, uh, everything was closed. We couldn't take any material, nothing. We couldn't have access uh, to uh, the departments. So all the uh, information uh, by the offices were provided electronically, all the um, mobility programs were suspended, the traineeships, uh, uh, both curricula and extracurricula were suspended too, all the activities of reception of students uh, were uh, suspended, that they could take place only by mail or Skype or something else. Uh, also, libraries were closed, uh, all events were suspended, and uh, um, uh, numerous sanitization interventions were carried out. Uh, the platform uh, uh, used by the University of Messina was the Microsoft Teams, uh, widely used all over the world, uh, as we uh, saw um, during this meeting. There was uh, tutorials for students uh, and for professors uh, immediately uh, uh, after the closing of the departments. And the University of Messina by Microsoft Teams, uh, uh, 1,050 students uh, could graduate, uh, 1,580 courses were activated, and 1,782 exams were carried out. These data are updated uh, at the end of June because uh, from July, there is a mixed uh, way of uh, um, modalities uh, for uh, more, most of all for exams and graduation. So what we could use uh, besides uh, the uh, very, very interesting sites of the online veterinary anatomy museum uh, of Wikivet, uh, I can remember that uh, uh, as a European Association, uh, we give a financial support uh, to the Online Veterinary Anatomy Museum. 
And uh, so for the microscopic anatomy, uh, we used uh, uh, this very interesting site, uh, the storageguide.com, with uh, um, beautiful uh, images of light and electron microscopy. Moreover, also this site, uh, uh, mbfbioscience.com, by the Iowa University. For microscopic anatomy, uh, we used uh, this site um, by Minnesota University with the beautiful videos and beautiful pictures uh, of carnivore anatomy and uh, ungulate anatomy too, the um, vanat.cvm.umn.edu. Another um, very interesting website by the University of Nebraska on bovines. Again, uh, Imaging Anatomy of Bovines uh, by the Illinois University. A Spanish site with beautiful images, uh, uh, magnetic resonance uh, images, uh, very, very good, well done. And another one, um, very, very well done, the Biosphere at 3D. Dot com uh, with uh, um, 12 model options, uh, but uh, uh, this was the only one by payment. I can say that uh, we had the possibility of uh, um, choosing these uh, websites because there was uh, an exchange of information among uh, quite all the professors of veterinary anatomy in Italy. And uh, um, what happened in the other university? In the University of Padua, uh, in the University of Padua, there are 32 departments and 12 schools. Uh, every department uh, has uh, at least one change agent. Who is the change agent? The change agent is a professor trained in innovative didactics uh, through a series of courses that are part of the teaching for learning program. Uh, this program uh, began uh, many times before, uh, before the COVID-19 epidemic, uh, pandemic. Um, so it was used uh, during this period. So these agents uh, carried out actions uh, aimed at improving and implementing uh, all aspects of active learning. Particularly during lockdown, they were very active in promoting courses to help professors who needed them. The courses were aimed at uh, uh, raising awareness of different platforms and use for online teaching and also for providing support for practical teaching. Also, a questionnaire was administered to all professors uh, and um, to understand which sources they used. And uh, was, uh, database was created uh, with specific sites for practical exercises. Also, uh, lobster licenses were acquired by the University of Padua for practical exercises. And it's important to know that uh, one of the, the six change engines of the Department of Agriculture and Veterinary Medicine in Padua is our president of the Italian Association of Veterinary Morphologists, Professor Giuseppe Radelli. From September, there will be meetings uh, to our professors uh, who did not teach during lockdown, but uh, uh, will be teaching in the next semester. And the group, uh, Professor Adelli, uh, Professor Adelli uh, presented uh, at the, a very interesting international conference on higher education advances uh, held in Valencia during June 2019. Uh, a paper about uh, this um, program, the Teaching for Learning program of the University of Padua, the experience of that university on this program, um, innovative program. What happened in Milan? Uh, in Milan, at the beginning of the course uh, during uh, the lockdown, the professors uh, uh, met the students uh, to understand uh, what were their choices for the front of lectures. The students chose the recorded lectures. So the professors recorded the lectures using uh, PowerPoint presentations and the educational films. And uh, uh, the practice uh, took place in streaming, but uh, with live recording 
to permit uh, students to review them. Also in Padua, the histologyguide.com uh, was used, uh, but for particular cases, uh, for luminance or the species, they provided the histological images. Uh, they, had, uh, they have around 90 students per, uh, um, in the year uh, of uh, uh, the teaching of veterinary anatomy. So uh, students were divided in uh, 18 groups of five people with 18 different topics. Every practice had a title, uh, the Jesse system, or a genital system, and so on. Yeah. <clears throat> the groups uh, had the task of studying the slides uh, the day before or in the days before the practice. And uh, during the stream, the professor chose at random the slide and the group to present. Um, every time the presentation took place in person, so one person described the other indicated with a pointer and uh, the professors uh, could understand whether or not the students were, um, had uh, the possibility of uh, uh, giving the right answers. In case of doubt, the professor asked uh, for the intervention of other colleagues in the group and opened the discussion. The same was done for uh, the musculoskeletal system, uh, bones and joint, with other websites. In Bologna, um, a system of uh, quizzes was used. Uh, there was the possibility to propose uh, images, uh, particularly during the microscopic anatomy practice. And it was useful to verify the level of understanding and learning of the students. The students were anonymous, so they registered with a nickname. So um, there, there wasn't a fear for judgment for them. They were involved, uh, considering also that they were forced to hours and hours of passive listening during lockdown. So the practice uh, um, was a little bit fun. The system also generated a kind of competition with a final podium uh, by the number of correct answers and the speed of response. The website used for was the kahoot.com. Another important part of the Italian experience uh, was uh, the surveys. Some of them, uh, them are still in progress, uh, like this one the uh, so-called Yoconto 2020. Uh, it was uh, carried out by the University of Pisa and Messina in collaboration with the universities of Florence, Turin, and Genoa. And this uh, study was designed to assess uh, the perception of risk, uh, the use of personal protection measures, uh, and to study the medium and long-term effects uh, of the epidemic and containing measures on the psychophysical health of uh, students uh, and professors uh, and employees also of the Italian universities. A study, a survey is, um, that uh, is finished uh, is this one, the so-called university DAD. DAD means uh, um, didactic at distance. And the questions were, how have professors and researchers lived the, the uh, online teaching? Did everything really go well? And above all, after the emergency, what will be left or what do we learn from this experience? Is it possible to learn something that can improve the teaching or what will be the new normality of the university life? To answer these questions, in June, a national survey was carried out in Italy um, on a large sample of 3,398 professors and researchers from um, numerous Italian universities who responded to this uh, online questionnaire. It, in particular, it was carried out by uh, a department of the University of Turin, in collaboration with the Inter University Center for Research on Higher Education Systems, uh, to which uh, the University of Milan, Pavia, Bologna, Florence, Turin, the Scuola Normale of Pisa, the LIUC, and the Foundation CRUI belong. So how did it go? Let's start by saying that really everything seems to have gone well. 
in this topic. The delays uh, in uh, starting classes have been contained. 72% uh, uh, of the professors were able to activate uh, distance learning immediately by March 13. The hours of lectures uh, did not deviate much from those expected. 86% of the professors held the same number of hours, 7% even more. In the master classes, 89% held all the scheduled hours and close to digitality in master's and doctorate courses. So 80% uh, of professors completed uh, the entire program, only 11% reduced it. 9% increased it, making more online materials available to students. So the majority of professors uh, adapted their teaching strategies to uh, distance learning. 67% so changed a little bit the content and the structure of their teaching. 24% kept them unchanged. And 9% took the opportunity to rethink their teaching considerably. So uh, live streaming lectures prevailed, 66% of professors took live streaming lectures, 15 uh, both live and pre-recorded lectures, 12% recorded the lectures and then made them available, 52% made teaching materials available online with or without audio commentary, only 7% provided teaching materials or did other activities without streaming or recording lectures. And also the number of students attending did not decrease. For 53% of the professor, the number remained unchanged. For 22% uh, even increased in 20%, only in 20% decreased, and 5% could not evaluate. Regarding the exam, all the exams took place uh, regularly. 92% of the professors had already held at least one online appeal. 37% only had an oral exam, 52% an oral exam and uh, also a written exam or a final test, 12% a written examination or another final test, and 61% of the professors believe that they have adequately assessed the student's preparation. All these data are very, very surprising if we think that only 9% of the professors interviewed had the previously had the distance learning experience and 17%, only 17% had some e-learning experience uh, but are limited only to online dissemination of learning materials. So in conclusions, uh, considering that uh, European policy cooperation, uh, the ET 2020, purchased uh, uh, more than 10 years ago, the following four common EU objectives, make lifelong learning and mobility a reality, improve the quality and efficiency of the education and training, promote equity, social cohesion and active uh, citizenship, enhance creativity and innovation, including entrepreneurship at all levels of education and training. Considering all these points, uh, we can say, we can suppose that uh, this uh, enormous uh, tragedy uh, could become a very important opportunity for all of us. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you for that uh, wonderful presentation, Dr. Bate. Uh, we'll have questions later on in the session. It's my privilege now to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Corneli from Ghent University uh, in uh, Belgium, and he's going to talk about uh, prioritizing practicals while crushing the curve. Uh, Peter. Okay. Thank you, Bob. I, yes. That's the one I want to share. It's there you are. It looks good. Okay, thank you. Um, right. Um, what I uh, would like to discuss with you is not only um, how COVID-19 affected our lessons in the, in the past semester and the evaluation, but also look forward to the next academic year uh, we have to work in a totally different uh, framework, but our approach will also be totally different than, than what we did 
in, in, in the last semester. Because, of course, when uh, the virus first uh, struck, then uh, we had an emergency shut, shutdown, a lockdown. Uh, it hit us somewhere in uh, our fifth week of education in um, the second semester of all years. Um, normally, we have 12 weeks of education in second semester followed by um, examination period. And in the second semester of uh, the first year, we teach the second half of general anatomy. In the second bachelor year, we teach uh, topographical and clinical anatomy, and we lay the focus on small animals, whilst in the first semester it was uh, large animals, horses, and ruminants. And soon, when, uh, when we went to lockdown, Ghent University decided to close down for the remaining um, for the remaining semester, so only already early in March, we knew we'll never return with face-to-face uh, -face, uh, classes and discussions. And whilst, uh, and that's totally con contrary to, to what happened in in our country, uh, even when we reopened after the first uh, after the first peak somewhere in May, and we reopened schools, uh, we remained uh, closed. As you can see uh, from the graph, we are currently in a, a second wave. We, we try to crush uh, as of uh, July um, by again imposing very strict um, measures. And we hope by the beginning of the next semester that we uh, will be able to, to restart at, uh, at the very low level. And um, it is in less than a month as it was in the summer. And what was the impact of that lockdown and switching in, in three days notice to, to online classes? Well, for, for theoretical teaching, the impact was not that great uh, because in the, in the last few years, we had um, experienced a dramatic increase in the number of students. Uh, I started uh, 10 years ago with less than 300 students and then in the first year, no, I started this year with four, 560 and more. Uh, at the beginning of the academic year because we have no admission restrictions. And, and all these students do not fit on our lecture halls. We still teach in the traditional way in, in large uh, auditoria and so on. And so uh, already for a couple of years, we um, record and stream our lessons while we are presenting them. And the only thing we we did in uh, that weekend notice is um, put all the recordings of the previous years uh, online. Uh, here you see a screenshot of such a recording is done by the Gallicaster um, system. Um, I usually don't teach with PowerPoint, with, with, but with an, an, a whiteboard software. Those who are interested, ProWise is freely available and the live demonstrations of plastinates and specimens and so on, on which I draw, is just done with a simple document camera. The brand name is Grevo. Of course, for the practicals, that, uh, that was totally different. But um, in fact, it's the same story, different version as all our previous speakers in, in this online meeting. So I won't go into detail what we did. Uh, we made videos, we made interactive PowerPoints, we did discussion groups whatsoever. We put it online and... Uh, for the students, and um, our learning environment is based on Brightspace. We call it differently, but it is a Brightspace a learning environment in which we also can do tests and 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 uh, assessments and whatsoever in in the most creative way you can uh, you can imagine. Of course, online teaching does not uh, help uh, improving dexterity and, and dissecting skills and so on. But therefore, we thought, okay. First year students, they will still have anatomy in the second year. We will postpone that for uh, next academic year. The second year students, they have had it in the first semester. They were assessed. There was a formal test on uh, dissecting skills. Normally, that, that should be um, sufficient. I won't go into detail in, in what we have done, only, um, I, again, like our previous speaker, would like to thank the people of Minnesota for putting uh, the cadaveric studies of the dog online because one third of our students did not have had the opportunity to, to dissect on dogs. So um, we used that software or that uh, resource to, to, to help them out. Um, and uh, for the cat, um, well, luckily for the cat, we had a, a huge stockpile, over 500 pictures and videos, all annotated on feline anatomy, like, uh, like this one. 
that we put online. However, um, this picture is not derived from uh, a cat. Uh, this one is derived from a tiger, uh, which we happened to, uh, not one, but uh, we, we happened to, to, to be able to dissect four tigers in, 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 in uh, as, as many years. And we normally don't document uh, regular animals, but animals that, that come into our facilities that are quite extraordinary. We document that and we used the yeah, tiger anatomy to, to teach uh, cat anatomy um, we, with, with all different aspects. And indeed, tiger is a little bit like a, like a big cat, a very big cat, uh, which makes it even possible to, to, to display the finest um, anatomical details. For instance, claw retraction mechanism that was uh, uh, as, as demonstrated here. But I won't go into detail in uh, what we have done so far. Um, let's move to uh, to to the next section and uh, on how we evaluated students after that uh, second semester. Universities reopened for evaluation, mainly for the uh, bachelor students and uh, master students. So the last three years of the veterinary education, it was still mainly online. But for the bachelors, we did it on campus. You see here in the picture our largest um, lecture hall we have at Ghent University. It accommodates normally 1,000 students, but in COVID uh, times, only 88 students could do their examination there. Um, but Kent um, University uh, resolved that by uh, hiring or, and, and escaping our own uh, boundaries and going to large convention centers and exposition halls that were free because of the situation. And here you see my 560 students, uh, the front half uh, of, uh, of them, in a very large exposition hall doing their anatomical uh, examination. So that, uh, that went also okay. It was a, a huge um, a uh, huge organization to get everyone with uh, COVID-related measures and mouth masks and uh, hand sanitizers and physical distance uh, to, to, to the correct uh, examination hall. But um, in fact, we managed to, to do so. Um, different was, of course, the um, permanent evaluation and um, permanent evaluation such as for the practicals. OK, that's uh, that shifted to participation on the online activities. But we have a program of uh, self-study in the first year, self-study of osteology. The osteological anatomy is not taught in classroom, but uh, we offer students all means, uh, as you can see them here studying in our museum with, with bones and coarse material whatsoever. Um, they sit on the floor rather than on uh, the table, whilst the, the table is free, but uh, never mind. Um, the, um, and, and during the year, they have multiple possibilities. They can take it multiple times um, to, to, to come to us for a test. But that's a face-to-face -face test, and uh, during that test, they are often a limited time and number of specimens, eight specimens, bones and skeletons, and they, they are asked to identify structures. And they can do it multiple times, but they, have a, they need at least one mark of that uh, evaluation for the final score. And some of those students have not done that test yet. So we designed an online test, um, and they had to fill out um, forms uh, or an online test while under video surveillance. We had not the opportunity to offer bones to them in 3D, but we offered them uh, the four uh, standard views of a single bone. We ask to identify what do you see, and they have to tick the correct boxes, or they re-identify the bone for them, and that they had to then identify the, the indicated landmark. Or, um, yeah, we'll, Brightspace is our newest, uh, and the first time uh, we use that learning environment. And in this new learning environment, in contrast to the previous one, we cannot indicate hotspots on, on pictures, so we, we made a, a, a grid overlay on, on some pictures, and sometimes we ask, okay, where would you locate a landmark X or Y? Of course, this came with a huge explanation of uh, what to expect and how we will uh, evaluate you now and, and, and what to do. And, and because of the fact that students were uh, allowed to do the test multiple times to get better marks or whatsoever. We have had some students who have done both of them. So in the first semester, they did the oral examination and in the second semester, they did the online examination. And for those, from those students, we asked 
feedback. What do you think? Is it comparable? Is it not? And uh, to our, uh, uh, we have positive uh, acclaim here. Uh, they considered equivalent uh, with the same level of difficulty. Some aspects were more difficult, but other were then uh, more easy. So same level of difficulty. And overall, 50% um, of the students who answered preferred the online test and 50% the uh, oral examination. So that is, is quite good. And um, of course, it, it, it was less stressful for them, they said, because it was well explained um, and um, they could a little bit more manage their own time. Uh, the examination was not on the pace by the examiner, but uh, they couldn't could go through the, the questions on the computer uh, at their own pace. And they also uh, liked that at the end of the uh, online evaluation, the computer could give them immediately the, the score. So it was the computer who evaluated. Of course, uh, we adjusted the score afterwards in case a student mistyped uh, some term, it got its mark. Remarkably, one of the one of the, the most uh, striking uh, comments was the fact that um, they liked the fact that uh, the computer only scores at the very end. It's also something we did with the oral examination. At the very end of the examination, we said, okay, that's your mark, you, you passed, you didn't pass. But apparently during the examination as an examiner, when a student gives you a wrong answer, uh, you say, oh, think again, it might be not... Uh, correct what you say, and apparently for some students this gives too much stress to proceed. So they like that they only got their uh, comments uh, immediately afterwards. Negative comments, of course, it's not 3D, you cannot turn, and that are restrictions and other restrictions, technical restrictions, the, 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 the type of software we use, uh, you have to scroll a lot, you have to search for your answer before you can click it, but that's not something we can uh, much do about. What about our final examinations? Well, um, to our surprise, um, the, yeah, we, we, we saw our pass rate from 30% from, uh, or 28% to almost 50%. You know, a first year examination and first year students, we don't have entry exams, we don't have an admission restriction. So the first year is a kind of selection year we have relatively low pass rates, but they, they went up uh, quite um, quite surprisingly. And that was the case for all second semester courses. That's that's the average. It's not cumulative. Whilst uh, when you compare to the previous year and the current year in, in first semester, that, that, that's, that was quite the same. We believe it's because of lockdown and that, that, that students and um, they got already before Easter holidays all the course content and there was nothing else to do. You couldn't leave your house uh, unless for shopping. You, you couldn't do anything uh, socially. And so what else to do than study during lockdown? Of course, we were also asked to reduce our number of questions to only evaluate essential competences. So it, it, it is maybe a story of, of, of both. Right. Um, where are we heading to? Um, well, our Flemish government, in collaboration with the Inter-University Council, uh, made up a kind of matrix, uh, it, depending on the viral status and the, uh, the pandemic status in, in our country, uh, some guidelines and, and regulations, what you, you can do for teaching and what you can't. Um, and it is expressed in, in kind of color codes, like beach flags or, or something from from green, there is no risk at all to red, uh, uh, huge pandemic spread. You have seen our uh, second wave um, in Belgium um, and it hit us more and, and earlier than, than our neighboring countries. We know our wave is still, is again declining. So we first feared we will have to start in code orange or even in code red uh, within the next month. But uh, apparently we may start in code yellow. What do these codes mean for our education? So I will lift out uh, two items. First of all, um, on-campus education, but uh, theoretical education. So in classrooms uh, or in, in, in workshops, but face-to-face, but, uh, -face, but mainly theoretical. Well, we can fill up an auditorium, a lecture hall, up 
to its 50% capacity, provided that everyone wears a mouth mask, uh, hand sanitizers, and so on. And when we have to shift during the year to code orange, only one out of five seats may be occupied with the same um, rules. That's the same rule uh, in code yellow, but here we can, um, with sufficient uh, physical distance, uh, we can do it also one out of five in code yellow. But to our very great surprise, and for the hands-on practicals, even in anatomy, there are no restrictions for the next academic year. We can do it at 100% capacity. The only additional thing, apart from the normal protective equipment that they wear, is wearing mouth mask and sanitize their hand more thoroughly. However, that's still no wild card. Um, 100 capacity capacity. I, I told you about the fact that we had a dramatic increase in students. We tend to overcrowd our section room. That will is, is not going to happen in, anymore. So we have to reduce the number of students per practical group. We have to uh, repeat the practical groups more often. There are also regulations regarding uh, ventilation and the total duration. You can uh, be in one single room before you have to empty it for a, a specific time um, frame, and so it can be ventilated and so on and so on. And the most important thing affecting or indirectly affecting our uh, practicals is um, is the rules, uh, extra rules for the uh, theoretical classes. Because and know that not only the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine streams and records its, its classes, but the entire university will do it. We have a lack of server um, capacity, and it is said that in every location we can only record or stream for two hours at maximum per day. So, so even so, the, the chances are high that when we enter a, a lecture room, we won't be able to reach every student, only half of the room can be filled, and we can't reach all other students because there will be no recording, no streaming anymore. And we won't repeat those theoretical classes. So we had to rethink uh, how we would approach this. So overcrowded section rooms, that's uh, for the past. And, and we are asked to more yeah, blend at Ugent here, to, to more give blended learning, flipped classroom stuff, uh, stuff like that. And therefore, our ID for the first year was um, this general anatomy, uh, not to teach in classroom, because I'm pretty sure that uh, I have to teach 90 hours in classroom normally, that most of them, uh, these sessions won't reach all of our students, and that we just make video clips like, uh, like this one, and um, short video clips in, in which we, we draw uh, in, in those knowledge clips, uh, that we draw, and we explain immediately what we have drawn in, uh, let's see, in uh, direct demonstrations, either here from out our museum or from the section room uh, when it goes to, to wet samples. That's, that's what we do. The equipment we use for that is, uh, is, listed, um, is listed here. We have only eight hours of theoretical contact moments left of the 90 in total in a whole year or the 60 in the, in the first semester. Um, the practicals, the practicals will mainly be dry practicals in, in uh, organized in small islands in, in, again, in this museum. Wet practicals in a section room, well, no, our section room will be re reserved for the our second year students. So dry practicals or demonstrations um, yeah, with physical distance and, 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 and small bowl islands um, with plastinets and osteological samples um, in our museum. For the second year uh, in which you teach clinical anatomy, the first semester is horse and ruminants, and the teaching will only be practicals, and in uh, which you will repeat a lot of times, will be almost uh, four days a week, our section room will be occupied. A single student will, will come to us twice uh, a fortnight, but we will be there uh, almost uh, every day. Um, theoretical contact moments, there won't be any except for eight contact moments for questions and answers only. So in some way, we'll have to fit the theory into the practicals and extract the theory from the practicals. And the way we 
try to do that is uh, by by a learning path, an introductory learning path, a pre-entry test before they started the practicals. And instead of teaching exhaustively the anatomy that they will see in the in the lecture room, no, we will teach just how the anatomy is applied in clinics and, and just by, by using scientific papers or, or videos, so we won't use handbooks or, or, or course material, no, scientific paper on, on, on lameness in horse, for instance, and, and how the clinicians use anatomy to make their diagnosis or to their prognosis and so on, and to show the students, hey, you need that anatomy, make sure you know it before you go to clinics, and the only way to learn it is with us in the, the section group. Um, they can rely on previous acquired competences from general anatomy, and only when we know, okay, here it, it is becoming too difficult or too complicated, we will do short knowledge clips of new theory, barely enough, just the minimums, um, so that they would understand what they see during uh, the practicals. During the practicals, because we only have a limited time, Every student will start with the same practical guidelines to follow, but depending on the specimen or their interest, the students or the group of students will be asked to um, dissect a particular aspect. So, for instance, the stay apparatus of the horse or, or um, female reproductive. I don't know uh, what, uh, just some examples. And, and to document that either by their own materials or by the multimedia facilities of our section room, um, which were improved lately, and, and to document it, annotate it, uh, and, and share it, and so teach each other um, everything what, what, what we intend to present to them. So, um, we hope that it works. Eh? Wish us luck, in as, many, as much luck that as these students have. These students are now currently doing their practical, no, their, their full examination uh, of the second year clinical anatomy in our section room. Double that number of students and you will have the new occupancy of uh, our section room in uh, new times. Uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Peter. A great presentation and too much work to keep the learning going on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Then we we go to the next presentation, and then we go to Dr. Fred Sinovats uh, from Ludwig Maximilians University from of Munich, and he's the editor in chef of anatomy, histology, and embryology. Then he will talk about the influence of the coronavirus pandemic on the anatomy, histology, and embryology. Then Fred, oh. Okay, thank you, Marco, for the introduction. Yeah, I want just to talk a bit on the influence of the coronavirus pandemic on our journal, Anatomia, Histologia, Embryologia. Not only, next slide, please. As a coronavirus does not only quite heavily infect our social contacts and the economy and also the teaching. But quite early in this year, uh, publisher Wiley gave a COVID-19 alert uh, because due to this constantly changing coronavirus situation worldwide, there will be changing demands on our editors, referees, and editorial office. And especially one thing which we were uncertain was the development of incoming manuscripts. The coronavirus certainly also has a profound effect on our research uh, activities and also quite a lot of more work with teaching also could have what we thought have an influence on the productiv productivity of our research. Uh, next slide. So as an editor, you can check on the website of Wiley the manuscript 
scripts, the manuscripts received, so the state and date uh, submitted, manuscripts undergoing review, final decisions, and many things others. And we get uh, standard reports from manuscript reviewers, the decision rate, the decision rate by months, uh, manuscript milestones and time from submissions to decisions. And uh, usually, uh, every two years on the European Association meeting, uh, I present a short report on the development of our journal. This year, unfortunately, uh, the Congress in Ghent has to be postponed. And uh, I really hope that I can uh, present uh, the data for the last three years next year in Ghent. Next slide, please. So to compare it with the last year, we have the data and they have been given by Wiley, manuscript received and decided in 2019. It was quite similar than the years before. We got about 386 original uh, articles and a special issue was from Bob Henry and Christoph von Horst on plastination. So the number of uh, manuscripts was about uh, 448, uh, 84. And uh, so 2019 was like more or less like any year before. And the number of uh, manuscripts it finally accepted was about 230. And also, we can look from which countries we get our manuscript on, and main contributors like Belgium, four accepted, none reject. And a big contributor is uh, Brazil, with 12 accepted, 27 rejection, and uh, Egypt with six accepted, 24 rejections, Germany 10 accepted, one rejected, and also now states like Iran with three accepted, or Japan with, see, with seven papers accepted and four rejected. So that's uh, the situation, and we would um, we wanted to compare that uh, with uh, the year of the pandemic with 2020. Next slide, please. So, manuscript received in this year uh, from January to the mid of August is more or less the usual number. We have only we have mostly 20, uh, 20 to 30 manuscripts per month, and we will probably end up at the end of the year if this trend uh, continues by about 300 or 400 paper. Next slide. And a more detailed analysis from the January when we started to look at that. We have also the usual uh, picture. About one third of the manuscripts have been checked, have been accepted. Uh, slightly more has been rejected, and about a third has to be revised and. Uh, resubmitted. Next slide, please. And just for another example, July 2020, about uh, one third has been accepted, uh, one third or one quarter is more or less pending, and also the number of rejected and revised uh, manuscripts did not uh, change com uh, significantly compared to uh, previous years. Next slide, please. Also, we had no problem to handle the manuscripts, the time from acceptance uh, to uh, uh, the time from submission to acceptance did not change much in original original articles, it was about 25 days. It took some 
worked long hours with the refuse. Uh, and so no real change uh, was observed. And also the distribution of contributing countries did not change. Yes, uh, we had originally the idea that heavily from COVID uh, affected countries like Brazil or others with a high number of, uh, of, of people infected with the COVID virus uh, may cause a reduction. But for Brazil, for instance, uh, nothing really changed. We had uh, 14 accepted, 18 rejected. Egypt also a big contributor with six accepted, 25 rejected. So research is going on in all this country at uh, comparative levels. And our original thought that it might as a stronger teaching activity might cause a effect on, on publication did not turn up. Next slide, please. So to su uh, a summary, uh, I can present you the following conclusions. We had a decrease in the number of submitted manuscripts during the eight months of this year, but it was comparatively quite small. No obvious change in contributing countries has been observed, uh, despite those countries were quite differently affected by the COVID-19 virus. There was no obvious change in the acceptance and uh, rejection rate, and no obvious uh, change in the time from submission to decision. That means that our review system works quite well. And um, so I, I'm really curious about the later development. It's certainly quite early after eight months to see the effects on, on the research and publication. And during the next few months, we will certainly know more. And I hope that I can present to you next July the data in Ghent. <laughs> and I hope that we can all meet us there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the uh, very interesting report on our journal. With that, uh, we'll move into a time of questions and discussion. Um, do we have some questions, please? Do we have Fernanda? Hello, Professor. Uh, first of all, I want to thank for all the presenters for the amazing presentations. And we got a few questions from the attendants. The first one is for Professor Abachi from S Sunday Hannah. Please, what's, what's the position or possibility of having practical classes using this model? Thanks. Uh, what are the possibilities? Uh, I can say that uh, there aren't so many possibilities considering that uh, in all the departments uh, um, of Italy, uh, the sections of anatomy were completely closed. So the only possibilities we had, as I showed, were only um, the possibility regarding websites, uh, pictures and videos uh, present on the websites. Uh, also because everything happened uh, in, in a day, we can say in a day, because from one day to the next one, in the beginning of March, director, the ministry and director in Messina decided to close the universities. So we couldn't have the possibilities of uh, um, cameras uh, in the, uh, the section rooms uh, or something uh, like this. Perhaps uh, uh, we hope that uh, uh, in the next academic year, in the next semester, there will be possibilities of in-presence lectures or perhaps the mixed uh, ways of uh, teaching um, frontal lectures, but most of all practice. 
So uh, we will hope that uh, the situation will change. We are quite sure that uh, a lockdown uh, will, um, will not happen again in Italy. But we don't know what will happen exactly. Perhaps nobody knows. Okay, Professor, thank you for the answer. Now another question for you uh, from Florence Ten. And actually it's a compliment and a question. Italy is a model of resistance in all. Congratulations on the way you manage the pandemic teaching. Now a question. Was the online student presence constant or varied, depending on the health situation? Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, the colleague uh, from uh, Romania, to thank uh, Florin. And uh, I can say that uh, there weren't, there weren't uh, significant changes in the presence of students uh, depending on the health situation. Um, for, for two reasons. The first one, in my uh, reality, in the reality of the University of Messina in the southern part of Italy, um, luckily we didn't have uh, a dramatic uh, pandemic. We didn't have uh, so numerous cases uh, like in the northern part of Italy. And uh, most of all, the young people were not interested by uh, the worst uh, part uh, of uh, the COVID-19. Uh, so um, our students uh, were healthy, likely healthy, so there weren't uh, changes. And um, in one of these slides, uh, I showed what was the situation uh, in the courses, in many courses of the universities of Italy. And uh, I showed that uh, there weren't uh, significant decreases uh, or differences uh, between uh, um, periods uh, in the presence of students. Okay, thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you. Uh, now a question to Professor Cornil from Florence 10. Congratulations, Professor Peter Cornil. What a good organization of courses in Belgium. Now a question. What the pre-entry test consists of? Mm. What the, what the pre-entry test consists of? Was that the question? Yeah, the question. Yes, I'm okay. Um, okay, so uh, thank you. Lawrence, from, uh, from, from, for your compliments. Best uh, of luck, of, of course, over there in, in Cluj. And our pre-entry test, it was mentioned indeed on our slides. Um, when discussing um, the introductory learning path before a student can come to our uh, section room to do it by sections, um, it's, it's just a test uh, online. A few questions to um, make sure that a student who comes to our uh, section room knows, first of all, the principles we learned through that uh, introductory course and um, is able to relate anatomical uh, structures to, to what we discussed. As I told, um, we will discuss in the introductory path um, more a clinical view or, uh, for instance, uh, tendon injuries and, and, and the whole horses land on, on, on tendons and, and, and what structures are involved. We'll discuss a stay apparatus, uh, for instance. And, and at least uh, the student should know what, uh, what anatomical structures are involved in that, otherwise at, at practical, he, can't, he, he or she can't even look into, into that when, when asked. Um, we, we mentioned through the introductory course also a few challenges. Uh, we will ask you during the practical to do this and to do that, and to that, make sure you know it. And of course, our questions will relate to, to that challenges we, we give to the students. Okay, thank you, Professor. And now a question to Professor Sinovets uh, from Diego Carvalho. Has any priority been given to articles dealing with the COVID thing? No, no, there's not given any priorities. Uh, when an article comes in, uh, I send it to the associated editors, uh, which uh, then uh, choose a at least two 
or even more uh, reviewers and uh, after two to eight weeks uh, we get the results and most of the manuscripts uh, has to be revised or, or rejected so that had no influence it was just it, everything went in the normal way and we had no delay we were afraid that we could have a delay with the reviewers it's one of the most uh, difficult things is to find uh, a number of reviewers if you think we have about 400 articles per year and uh, we try to have at least two reviews per article you can imagine uh, that's quite a task and i'm really thankful that many of uh, of our colleagues are prepared uh, to give reviews even at that time so that worked quite well until now <laughs> Okay, Professor, thank you. I guess we got no further questions. So if you can. I have, I have a, a comments and a questions for Peter and Franco and Fred. Because uh, Fred showing us that uh, the research is going on. And in, in Brazil, how do the universities close the door for the classes, uh, they, they are open for the research labs and with some restrictions like uh, the mandatory use of PPE and the, the number of the students in the lab should be maybe two or one or three students depend on the lab. And I would like to know how is the research labs in in, in, in Ghent or in Estina, uh, if, if Franco had some has some information about other universities in Italy. I, I begin. May yeah. I? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I can answer you. Um, as I told you, all the departments were completely closed uh, in Messina and in the other in the other universities of Italy for around two months. So also the research was suspended, and what we could do was only to write at home, but uh, we hadn't the access to um, the laboratories. Uh, we could access the laboratories uh, only uh, in the middle of May, but with a, a strict number of uh, people in the laboratories with uh, strict rules. But uh, for around two months, uh, we couldn't do anything. And so during okay. two months, uh you you i think that you lost some experimental research and uh, am i correct because we had yeah. some problems we had some troubles here during the the beginning of the pandemic because the labs uh, were closed then we lost some experiments but it, it's it's the same here there um, I can say that uh, in my uh, department, uh, in my section of morphology, we didn't lose uh, the experiments uh, because uh, luckily we were in an advanced part of uh, most of the experiments uh, in that period. Uh, so we could write uh, more than uh, a paper. Uh, so. It, was, uh, it wasn't uh, a real damage for us. Also because uh, the, the middle of May, we, will, we, uh, we began to work uh, day by day in uh, mm -hmm. a good way. <laughs> yeah, maybe I can comment on the, on the situation in Ghent. Um, as for the research in Ghent, at the beginning of the lockdown, um, it was mandatory to, um, yeah, 
everything that could be halted should uh, stop immediately. Some some experiments on on cell lines on on living animals and whatsoever uh, had to be phased out. Nothing new could uh, could be restarted. And and that lasted uh, in general uh, somewhere until the July no June June eight so the beginning of, of June. The only thing that could continue was uh, COVID-related uh, research, and and even for that research, and even for for clinical care and so on, our laboratories were stripped from from all alcohol, from from simple barcode scanners, from test tubes, for from from personal protective equipment. All moved to 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 other um, laboratories involved in beating COVID-19. Um, as from June, we could restart um, with uh, physical distance and 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 move um, uh, move coverings and so on. And now in our second wave, again telework is the norm. But if uh, you cannot do uh, what you intend to do by telework, you can come uh, to work to, to do your experiments. So now there are no restrictions. Uh, but only the recommendation to do it at home when it is possible. Fred and Bob, do you want to say something? Bob? <laughs> do you hear me? Your microphone is off, Bob. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, friends. Yeah, I think uh, I told you about the publication rate during the last eight months. And uh, that certainly does not really tell us how the research is going on, because probably most of the data which were published in the first part of the year have been collected during the last one, two years at least. So uh, people use that time to write manuscripts and uh, what is going on with research in the different uh, countries is quite difficult to tell uh, but I think that is quite handicapped everywhere and we will see the effects of, uh, co of the coronavirus only in one, two years time. So at the moment, we are we have the results from uh, the last years and publication. Yeah. I think pe people uh, try to they have got the time and they they are quite eager to have publications. So we will see the effects of research restricting later on. Yeah, and. What the journal concerns, we uh, twenty nine we had that special issue, and uh, it's this year in September, Johanna Plenzel from Berlin will publish a special issue on angiogenesis, and we have also several virtual issues, one uh, on the research in Germany and one from with on the way from. Peter uh, on Belgian and Dutch research. And I think we also have planned and started is, is this regional uh, virtual issues from uh, Latin America. So there's a lot of activities, but all of these activities uh, is the result from previous research, not what is going on now. Yes. Okay, Bob. Okay, um, we'll proceed on. I'll say first that in the U.S., research has slowed down markedly, but we still have access to the lab. So it's however each person um, relates to the pandemic as to how much they do. Okay, we'll go on with the oral presentation number seven of our oral presentations. Uh, this is be by Uliana Casimir from. Uh, I think, Bob. Yes. I think that we have one more question, Fernanda. Okay. 
from, from William Paris. Can you see, Fernanda? Your microphone is off, Fernanda. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we have a question for Professors Cornille and Abati. How many students make postgraduate studies, PhD, in Italy and in Belgium? Um, maybe for Belgium, the, the, the figures of veterinary medicine, the total number, I don't know. Um, but uh, on average, our faculty delivers um, 40, 43, 45 um, doctorates per year. Um, and doctorate program is something between three, four, or six years when, uh, when, it, when it are assistants. And in our lab, or morphological lab, we have five, six, seven, eight, um, eight people currently doing a PhD. And regarding Messina, um, I don't have uh, the exact number of postgraduate students uh, in all the universities of Italy. Uh, I can tell um, William that uh, in the Department of Veterinary Science of Messina, every year we have uh, around six, eight uh, students uh, for the PhD course. And for the uh, veterinary anatomy, we have uh, uh, around two, three students per year uh, as PhD student. Okay, thank you, professors. Uh, I think we got no further questions, Professor Marco. Okay, thank you, Fernanda. You're well welcome. Okay, so we will start our remaining um, lectures and uh, this lecture will be by Juliana Casimir from Bucharest, Romania and uh, she's going to be speaking on online practical education using histology lab at home. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Hello. Can you uh, hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, we can, um, we you can see me. We, we need your presentation. Yes, of course, immediately. Immediately. Uh, hello to everyone. I'm uh, really happy to be here today, uh, connected with uh, all my colleagues from the entire world. And uh, firstly, I want to thank to Vava for this great initiative and to reviewers that gave it gave it to me the opportunity to present my work. I uh, participate at all uh, the VAVA meeting uh, until now in both weekends. And uh, our colleague's presentation impressed me so much by diversity, quality and resources. Gross anatomy teaching uh, issues being truly important in this period. Uh, in histology, uh, things uh, seems to be more simple. Uh, consider that um, uh, we are using 90% of time um, uh, glass specimens, permanent specimens. And um, of course, uh, uh, yeah. uh, why, why this, uh, why this uh, idea, why this concept, histology lab at home? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, yes. I, cannot see, I cannot see your PowerPoint presentation. The, did, did you share your screen to show? Oh, you? oh, 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 oh. Sorry. I. On the bottom of the screen? Yes, 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 yes. Just a moment, just a moment, just a moment. Oh, just a moment. I can't do this. Okay. Please, please, please. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Now? Now you, you, you need to put your PowerPoint presentation. 
Now yes, of course. Screen, but... Yes. Now is there? Not not the PowerPoints. Mm. Only your screen. Okay. Just a moment, just a moment. I don't know maybe what happened, maybe. what really happened, sorry. Maybe you need to, to look for your PowerPoint icon on the bottom of the screen. Yes, of course, I did that, but I don't know what happened. And I've practiced, believe me. <laughs> and uh, the internet uh, issue is so uh, amazing all the time. Uh, you are sorry. Your screen. You just need to look for your PowerPoint presentation. Yes, I, I have the PowerPoint there, but uh, maybe the internet connection is so slowly. Maybe. Because I uh, add the share uh, for everybody, the share button, and uh, I really don't know what happened. Yes, uh, here uh, uh, on my computer, I can see that uh, uh, my computer tried to share my screen, but uh, I don't know. I really don't know what happened. Sorry. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will try to to make uh, to make all that steps again, please. Okay. At the beginning, with no 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 no. Just a moment, just a moment, just a moment, just a moment. My presentation. Okay. My presentation is here. <sighs> yes, yes, yes. And now <laughs> I can't see my screen here. <sighs> I can't see my screen here. Sorry. You need you need to click the right button. Yes, of course I did all, but uh, I can't do that. I can't see my screen there. I can't see my screen there. Oh no. Sorry. This happened only to me. No, to and others will be also. Juliana, and will be memorable. I will, I will, yes. You, you, you can do different. You can, can you send me your presentation by mail? And we no. can. I will close, uh, I, I will suspend the internet connection. I will close it all and I will do all the things for the beginning. It's, it's okay, like this. You can, but we, we can go to the second presentation. Yes, of course. And I, I will present that at, uh, yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, okay. please. It's a wise uh, decision. And I will present at the end. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. And it's sorry okay. for this. It's okay, Juliana. Okay. So, that, that, so we, we go to the next presentation. Uh, we go to the Kev, introduce Dr. Kevin Hannon from Purdue University in the US. And he's talking about making online review section challenging using hidden answers in multiple quiz formats. Dr. Hannon. Dr. Hannon is, is there. Dr. Hannon, is your uh, microphone on? There we okay. Dr. Hannon, is your microphone on? Turn your microphone on. It's. OK. 
Kevin, turn your microphone on, please. Excuse me? <clears throat> Professor Sampaio, could you uh, look to your WhatsApp? Okay. Hey Kevin, Kevin, uh, you need to to get out of the the meeting and then came, came in again. Okay, just try to to go out and go back. We we can wait for for you. <clears throat> Eliana? Yes? Kevin had some troubles to, so with, with his microphone. Then you, you can try to share your screen and then share your PowerPoints again. Yes, no, I'm doing this. Okay. Uh, it's very, I don't know, unusually. Uh, when I try to share my screen, I see you, and I don't know what happened. Is I can't see my screen. You were sharing your screen before, but you need to look for the PowerPoints in your screen. Okay. Okay. Kevin, you just try your microphone now, just to see if it's working now. Good evening. Okay. I don't know, maybe. Kevin?
Okay, Juliana. I'm here. You can start your presentation now, okay? I, I can see mm. your PowerPoint. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. I'm so happy. Yeah. I did it. I can like to hear you. <laughs> okay. I'm for the second time happy now. Okay. Together with our colleagues and now secondly with my presentation. <laughs> I can't see you. I can't see my presentation. Can you see my presentation? Yes. 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 You, can, you can start your presentation now. Yes, of course. Um, try to share my screen. <laughs> Can you see my presentation? Yes, good. Oh, wonderful. Okay, I will. I will make a short presentation. I prepared. A, I'm. Uh, I was prepared a lot, but uh, I will make a short presentation because the idea is very simple: histology lab at home concept. And why this? Because I uh, uh, I was able to study at home uh, from the times that I was student. I. Uh, I uh, had my first microscope when I was a student in my first year. My father bought to me on the, like a Christmas gift. And um, I studied at home uh, from the first year. And in this pandemic times, uh, I tried to, to, to see if uh, this concept, histology lab at home, uh, will be possible. And uh, yes, will be possible because uh, it was possible 20 years ago, uh, but I was passionate on histology and I'm um, I'm uh, uh, lecturing in histology, but uh, uh, 20 years ago I was a simple student and I used 20 years ago this mechanical uh, microscope at home. But today our faculty in Bucharest, uh, uh, our faculty has some uh, performance microscopes uh, of new era microscopes uh, with a Wi-Fi system and uh, this type of microscope, it's very simple to be carried and uh, I uh, decided with my colleagues to uh, to use our microscopes for, from our home because we can connect this type of microscope with any devices with uh, any tablet laptop uh, screen uh, and uh, with with any modern devices uh, the the main thing is the internet connection. Um, and um, of course, in the Bucharest, the second uh, semester um, started on uh, uh, the February 24. Uh, and we worked in that period in the first three weeks of the semester with small uh, group of students with only 12 uh, students on each group. And for us, it was very simple to to work face to face with the students. And the activity was 100% percent practical. And of course, after 12 of February, uh, when the emergency state decreed uh, and lockdown happened, uh, our our um, uh, study uh, was necessary to be transformed in 100% virtual. And uh, the question is uh, how this uh, will affect uh, our did didactic uh, activity. And uh, for this uh, thing, I tried to, to, I tried to be fast and I tried to develop uh, rapidly the, the, the histology lab at home concept uh, using using five steps. And of course, the first question was, um, this, this form of study uh, can be proof at home? And, and the answer is already done. Yes, uh, we, uh, we uh, have at home uh, from, uh, from, um, uh, from the 12th of March, our collection and our microscope with Wi-Fi system incorporated, connected with our laptop, and of course, the internet. And um, what are differences? 
uh, yes, we can connect uh, our microscope with our computer and with our students' uh, electronic devices, tablets, laptop, mobile phone, because in Romania, the students have all that they need. And supplementary, our faculty uh, give it to uh, for our students' um, tablets for the uh, for the home lessons, and um, yes, the difference will be that uh, there is not a possibility to directly handle the microscope, and dexterity can be lost. But um, here. Uh, we have uh, the second, and here we are discussing about second semester problems, and students uh, are uh, already uh, are already um, uh, handled the microscope and uh, uh, have the skills for uh, this. And is it really possible? Uh, could be possible. Uh, yes, I told you, we can connect our uh, microscope with our computer and after with the students uh, using uh, Zoom platform, uh, using um, the e-learning e -learning platform that our university developed and adapted very fastly. Uh, our university platform uh, already exists, but was uh, so um, uh, um, adaptable and uh, was um, was um, uh, was uh, useful for the distance um, distance um, uh, teaching and uh, very very fast in uh, in only two weeks uh, our IT department uh, adapted our platform a model type platform to uh, our necessity practical necessities and um, of course how uh, can the method be uh, improved uh, for this i tried to uh, develop uh, rapidly a system uh, using uh, five uh, five steps and um, i tried to uh, i tried to uh, imagine in the middle of uh, this idea, the practice, the student focusing on the practice and student that uh, that need to have a, a guide uh, direction, a guide way uh, to use all the materials that uh, that um, they uh, already have. And um, uh, the first idea is to uh, understand. Uh, to understand, the first step is to understand, to understand using words. Uh, and of course, using a practical histology book um, available uh, available in an electronic format. And um, uh, the second idea is to apply what the students understand. And here we are talking about uh, um, about uh, four steps uh, and uh, how this. Uh, can be uh, possible uh, using images and using different files with images from the study chapters uh, in the second semesters, and of course a lot of videos. And at the first, uh, at the first step, uh, at the first step, um, the first step is. Um, constructed by a practical histology uh, book uh, and uh, I uh, create this material uh, many years ago but I try to adapt it at new conditions and um, the idea of these materials was to uh, follow uh, to follow strictly um, a guideline for the study, for the histological study. And firstly, I tried to uh, describe each structure that need to be studied in for each week uh, in all the semester time. And after the topics, what what the students need to to study, uh, and after uh, the second uh, the second aspect uh, referring at the journal and detail uh, image um, that are described like uh, the student is in front of the microscope, uh, but uh, the difference is here that the students read about um, read about that topics, and. Um, after um, at the third point here uh, is histostructural identification uh, and um, uh, here uh, this point referring at what students need to know to recognize rapidly that structure one uh, with one or few 
um, structural particularities uh, with which make the difference uh, with other similar structures. It's like a shortcut for the students and it's very useful for the students when uh, they uh, are prepared for the uh, practical exam. And the last aspect here about practical histology book in electronic format is the sketch aspect. I tried to, to uh, establish a way uh, of detail, um, detail uh, ideas for uh, drawings for students because not each student, uh, not, not each student, it's, it is a very a good student in uh, art. Uh, not all the students uh, have skills in art and uh, uh, guidance aspect about uh, drawings of different uh, histological structures was so useful. And about uh, the second uh, step of uh, the histology lab at home concept, it's a folder with uh, uh, labeled digitized images, but uh, the difference is here that I I uh, made a lot of description directly on the image, and I tried to to draw uh, on directly on that image uh, because the students uh, consider very useful this aspect to establish um, to establish carefully uh, the cell area aligning them and uh, the students uh, could understand more um, using uh, the visual memory here uh, and of course, this uh, uh, this uh, digitized images uh, represents a group of histological images from each slides that students normally uh, study in the uh, laboratory from each chapter, and um, of course, at the third point, uh, the third point referring at the video, and uh, the videos are um, uh, are made from the, each slide. And uh, I tried to, here I tried to see uh, by another point of view a video because uh, I saw on the internet a lot of resources uh, and a lot of videos with a lot of explanation for the students and a lot of um, uh, scanned slides. But uh, here I tried to recreate the microscopical study and I tried to recreate the lab atmosphere and I tried to recreate uh, the students' ideas and the students' feelings in front of the microscope. Uh, like like um, the student is there and like the student is that that uh, handled the microscope. And of course I use, uh, I try to use the videos uh, and I tried to launch a YouTube channel, uh, but until now uh, I uh, solve only a prototype, a histology lab at home, uh, and I uh, launch only a video for, um, uh, for, um, 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 for students. And, um, uh, and uh, the fourth point is, um, the fourth, the fourth step referring at the worksheet. Uh, of course, the students uh, have already notebook, uh, laboratory notebook uh, or sketch book, uh, but uh, this uh, uh, worksheet uh, uh, contains the most important aspect of the laboratory uh, topics and the students can add addition, additional notes and sketches uh, if uh, they are necessary in this uh, generous uh, um, free space and um, the worksheet will be scanned and sent uh, at the end of the semester or the students can took simple a photo with this worksheet and it's very important to to count it uh, students activity at the end of the semester um, and um, the uh, fifth point okay. is uh, uh, the answer key using images, a quick test based on images. Uh, the students have to identify the structures uh, pointed by uh, answer um, uh, by arrows, uh, colored different. And um, at the end of the semester, a few of these images are selected, selected randomly uh, for the practical exam. Uh, students appreciate so much this type of test because uh, 
they uh, will recreate the atmosphere of the practical exam um, situation. And uh, all these uh, resources uh, can be communicated with the students using, uh, using the learning platform of our university. Uh, the students can add their, uh, their uh, worksheet and their, um, their um, uh, answer of the test uh, uh, problems. And um, uh, the Zoom uh, app was um, useful for uh, interact live with the students and um, uh, discuss uh, uh, different problems, uh, uh, especially at the end of the week. Uh, and of course, the main um, the main uh, communication system was the uh, WhatsApp uh, group, History Interactive, too, uh, because ensure a very fast communication with the students. Um, and uh, uh, okay, uh, the student um, the student uh, opinion um, was um, was. Um, uh, was here in the questionnaire uh, that was created to uh, evaluate uh, the students' uh, ideas regarding the applicativity of online uh, study in the practical approach of veterinary histology. Uh, responding students um, considered that um, uh, for practical histology, the classic face-to-face -face method is superior uh, compared with the online method. But uh, for the future, uh, and here we have uh, 73, uh, almost 74% uh, of students, they considered that um, uh, the both methods uh, could be combined uh, for uh, uh, an efficient uh, study. Uh, and of Dr. course... Dr. Kazmir, one minute, yes. please. One minute, yes. And uh, in conclusion, uh, the laboratory uh, lab at home concept uh, was uh, useful for the students. Uh, the students was uh, the students were agree with it, and um, they need to follow the way to repeat, to understand for reability, and to verify uh, the knowledge. These are the steps that they need to uh, they, they need to follow and uh, uh, that three points are uh, learn think and imagine and uh, of course um, in the future uh, we try to make uh, some uh, steps uh, to develop our system uh, together with uh, our team that uh, we love uh, histology uh, thank you uh, so much, and uh, forgive me for uh, these um, technical problems. Waiting from Bucharest. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. Don't worry about the technological problem. This is all around the world. Yes, I understand this. Yeah. What happened to me, and <laughs> this was. Then, now we're gonna. Go to the next presentation of uh, Dr. Kevin Hannon from Purdue University in the US. And he will be talking about making online review sections challenging using hidden answers in multiple ways for minds. And Kevin? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Well, that is good to hear, Marco. I'm very happy. Thanks, thanks to Marco and to Bob, and it was certainly made for an exciting Sunday morning here in the last couple of minutes. My heart rate is racing. So basically, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about, many people have been talking about doing some things online, and that's due to COVID, but um, I want to talk about a little bit about a simple tip. I'm going to call it a tip about what to do to make some online review sessions or anything. And this can be done with COVID, it can be done in face-to-face, -face, it can be done with other. But it's basically how to make these sessions a little more challenging. A uh, little background, I teach anatomy to veterinary students and vet nursing students, and I've done this both for about, um, I've taught anatomy for 20 plus years, 23 years to veterinary students, and I've taught online to vet nursing and in face-to-face, -face, but I've taught online for 
over 10 years now, 12 years to be exact, in an online situation. So I've come up with some ideas during this, and a lot of these are common sense, but like I said, I thought I'd just share them a little bit. And in 2011, I created an interactive self-examining educational platform that would actively increase preparedness and facilitate learning. And it uses uh, it uses an, uh, a- active retrieval. So for those of you that are um, the Make It Stick, so that's a great book about methods to, um, I'm a big fan of that book, using active retrieval to learn things and to keep working with things such as anatomical concepts and terms and things like that. So the general setup of my platform is the first thing they do is read an, a lesson. And this is an online lesson, and this is done both face-to-face and in online courses. This is always the first time they have come across the material in this. So this is novel to them. They haven't had a lecture on this. They haven't had anything else. This online lesson is the first time they see it. After they read the online lesson, they then take a series of interactive online quizzes. Now, these are either basic or transfer quizzes. And these review quizzes can be either open or hidden. And I'm going to talk about what that means here in a minute. Basic quizzes. Basic quizzes are questions over the lesson material. They basically utilize the same images they've seen in the lesson. So it's really kind of just basic recall. It's just giving back to what they've seen. It's to build a vocabulary. It's to kind of get an idea and kind of move forward. The transfer quizzes, these are also questions over the lesson material. But in contrast to the basic uh, quizzes, these use images and modalities the students haven't seen. For example, cross-sections, radiographs, CT scans. So these are novel images and novel things they have to transfer the information they learned in the lesson and the basic basic quizzes to another situation. So here's kind of an example of this in the simplest form. But the student will read the online lesson. Let's say it's it's a description of the aorta and the thorax and the position and things like this and function and relativity, the basic quiz would ask them to just give this back. What is the structure? It's the the thoracic aorta. Transfer quizzes would ask in different scenarios, in radiographs, in CT scans, in clinical situations where you look at this arrow through the heart and thorax and you can say, is this hitting the aorta or not? So these are considered more difficult in transferring this basic information to new modalities and novel situations. So the point being is that these oops, these basic and transfer quizzes can be either open or closed, as I like to call them. So here's an example of a quiz with open answers. So here's our question with the aorta, and they have unlimited tries, and these are low stakes. So they get this back, and this would be an example of an open quiz. So quite frankly, they can type in the answer, they can hit the reveal button for a quiz, or once they type in the answer, they always can check and see if they're correct. So basically, with the open answer quizzes, there's no limit to the number of tries. They have a, they have a reveal button for a clue if they need Quizzes with hidden answers, an important point being is that they have a limited number of tries. They also don't have the reveal button for the clue. Now they have to type in the answer and get it correct, and they only have five tries. So um, the other thing is, once they put it in, they get immediate feedback. So this is a little more higher stakes, especially with the limited tries. So again, we're talking about four different types of quizzes. I've talked about basic and transfer. Basic is the easy quiz. Transfer is a little more difficult, and they were delivered both in an open and closed format. So some other important points, I give students points for completing these quizzes by a deadline, so the score is what they get, so it's kind of high stakes. Very important is that these quizzes are open book, and students are encouraged to look back at the lessons. And I know Peter said something in his presentation about they look at that as a negative, and I found that to be true. Students do look that is a negative bit. It's terrible. They have to look back, right? They can't Google something. But that's why these are designed to look back through your lesson, look back to the images, and try to transfer that information. And as I said before, this is the first exposure of the students to this topic. So this is novel to them. So the setup is throughout the semester, and the results I'm giving you are for veterinary students who are in person, but they did these online. But I've also done surveys on veterinary students when we went offline last spring, and all of my under um, all my vet nursing online, I've given similar surveys and done similar results and found the same. 
And throughout the semester, they basically went through different lessons. And then they would go through and they would either take these quizzes as hidden or open. So again, the basic are the easier, the transfer are the more, more difficult. The hidden are the higher stakes with limited number of tries. Open have the reveal and quiz. And then at the end, they get their points and other feedback, other other um, motivation to do this is they have proctored quizzes and exams, um, both online and offline, to get these right. So they are motivated to go through these and learn the material. So I, after this, I did survey the students, and these particular, these are veterinary students, and I asked them if they preferred, these are basic quizzes now, the easier, more handback. Did they prefer them as open or hidden, meaning lower or high stakes? Well, in this instance, there was no difference between students on uh, whether kind of the class was split in two, and it's generally a 50-50 ratio. They have no choice in this issue with easier quizzes. The most common comments supporting these open basic quizzes are less pressure and less time to finish, and they kind of like these as practice for the harder transfer quizzes. And many students said that even if these are open, they still treat them as closed and they try until they get them correct. So they still treat them either way, but they were rather ambivalent with the easier basic quizzes, whether they like them open or closed. So then I, the survey has been asked before, do they like the harder transfer quizzes as open with clues or hidden with limited tries and they have to get the answer correct to see the correct answer? And I was a little bit surprised by this. This is a, this is a result that comes up repeatedly when I survey the students. You can see that there's an overwhelming switch where they prefer the hidden, more higher stakes, harder quizzes. So this ratio, this is a total of 75 students, and you can see it's a pretty good ratio, 66 to 9, for preferring the harder transfer quizzes where the answers are taken. And if you break this down by, so I also looked at this, and I correlated it to their performance at the end of the class. And I looked at their answers, and that's about when the survey was done, where they'd been exposed to all the different types of quizzes. And an, and an interesting trend arose that I saw. So this is the top one half academically performing students in this class. And you can see that the majority of them preferred hidden transfer, about a 35 to 2 ratio. And in the bottom half, um, there was more people who did not like the open transfer quiz. And when you look at the top four child performing students, all of these students like the hidden, more difficult, um, basically set up of the quizzes. So the high-performing students really like to be challenged is kind of the take-home message here. And support for, if you look at what their comments were, if you look into the groups with the performing uh, students, even throughout the class performance level, the majority of responses centered around challenged me or forced me to think. And I thought that was kind of a mature and, uh, a reason why they liked this approach. And a lot of comments, like, I definitely fell, I knew it better when I was challenged to answer correctly, and I had a limited number of tries, challenged me to digest, and all kind of similar vein of go through, do the lesson, read the lesson carefully, and not uh, do the quiz. I gave up more quickly when the answer was available. And the, the clue or reveal button gave me a false idea. I knew the answer, but I did not. And support for the open or the easier transfer quizzes was basically they thought the close was too stressful and took too much time. And again, these are primarily students in the lower quartiles of the class. And I'm not saying that I think these are valid criticism, but you can see they're more concerned with stress and the time. It took. And Peter also said a comment about this, and I found this interesting. One support for open, the close, one note against the, the transfer was is our students will say they're tricky or semantics. And I believe every anatomist out there will agree with me is, is tricky and semantics equal? Is that, that's not really correct, right? The answers are correct. There's a difference between correct and tricky or semantics. And sometimes the students get a little bit confused about that, but this is a good way to train them into some, a correct answer is the correct answer. It's not a tricky answer or semantic answer. So I, I feel that hidden answers, no matter how difficult, have a benefit. But some hints about it are, you need to be very clear about what you're asking. And that's not a bad thing. When you formulate questions, you have to be very clear about what you're looking for. And good students not only tolerate it, but they actually, I found they prefer it. And one anecdote is that I found that when I've given students these closed transfer quizzes and they really have to look at the content material closely, they'll even find errors in some of my presentations and things that haven't been brought up to me in years past. So I do know anecdotally they're reading it more closely and they're taking more time. Some other final thoughts about doing this, it is labor intensive. 
And if you do get points, it does drive grades up. So that's something you have to consider about. But the point for today is that it can be applied to any kind of question. The message I'm giving here is you give them review questions. Don't give them the answer. Make them work to get the answer correct. And I'm sure a lot of people do that, and maybe it's common sense. But I think as I came across this, it wasn't common sense for me. And an important point here is to limit the number of tries and keep that as a low number. So when I originally started this, I gave many tries, but students then will just start wheeling and dealing and throwing in any answer. And if you keep the answers low, like anywhere from two to four, or something like that attempts, they'll, they'll slow down and they'll work harder to get the answer right the first time. So I think in summary, and I went through this rather quickly, but making online resources challenging can be challenging. And I think that I would just encourage people that what I've learned through the years is to think about using a system with some hidden answers where they have to work to get the answers before they're revealed to them and slow them down. And initially, the students will not like it, but they will eventually be trained to come around. And like I said, at the end, you can see at the end, so through my, summary, through my summaries and surveys, the students will come to appreciate the fact that something has slowed them down and make them work harder. <laughs> Okay, I think that we have some questions, Fernanda. Yes, we have. Uh, first, I want to say congratulations on the presentations. And the first question is for Dr. Kazimi. And actually, is a compliment and a question. Very nice information. You came after a long struggle, but your presentation work in Stology is amazing. Please tell about process of samples. Also, you performed at home? Okay. I uh, I saw I saw that question. It's very uh, interesting, but uh, I uh, uh, I'm referring here at uh, teaching process, not uh, performance process of slides. Uh, of course, we can. Uh, go at home with whole laboratory, but we can go at home with our microscopes, with our slides, like uh, our colleagues from Nottingham go at home with skeletons, for example, in pandemic times. Uh, this concept is adapted for pandemic times. And uh, uh, like uh, our students, uh, told me and like the questionnaire um, relief to us, the students obtained for uh, a combined study using uh, online and face-to-face -face study. But this depends on the epid um, epidemiologic evolution uh, of the COVID-19. Thank you for the question, Dr. Steve. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for uh, Professor Han uh, Dr. Hanna from Ana Costagliola. Uh, great program. Is it possible to get it or is it reserved to students of your faculty only? No. <clears throat> no, they, um, if anyone's interested in looking at it or looking through how to make one, just email me and I can talk to them and share how to go around making it and how to use it and et cetera, et cetera. So it's available to anyone. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to pass the word to uh, Dr. Mar Marco. Okay. Uh, I think that we need to have a little break. Just, just we will have a little break in the in the YouTube broadcast. And the first question is for Dr. Larger than my presentation break? No, just just for one minute. So two minutes. <laughs> the problem is that my camera is not on. Can you see me? Yes. Yeah, but now I can see you and I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> but in YouTube, you cannot see me. I think so. Yeah, well, actually, it's a compliment and a question. Can you see me? Yeah, now, now the camera is, is on. Yes, it's working now. I think so. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay. Then you don't have more questions? No, Professor Marco, that's it. Okay, then you can finish the, the meeting. I had some uh, words to say, then uh, we have come to the closing of the first WAVA meeting after two weekends of intensive and fruitful discussion that will help us uh, to overcome the difficulties of the COVID-19 pandemic times. Th this pandemic brought us many problems uh, to teach anatomy, especially practical classes. Since this is our worldwide, worldwide change, challenges, I realized that this meeting could give us the opportunity to exchange experience and ideas, but what we have seen here exceeded my expectations. We had fantastic presentations showing success, successful experience in different universities, sharing of teaching resources, new ideas to deal with students, not only to keep the classes safe for them, but also how to keep their emotional health in good conditions. So, in my opinion, the, the meeting was very productive and showed that we can cope with this adverse situation with collaboration. Uh, I would like to congratulate all the invited speakers and the ones who submitted abstracts of all uh, of you did a very good uh, job. You really brought us uh, great presentations. I would like to thank Professor Seca Erdogan and William Paris who worked behind the screen, helping us to advertise the meeting around the world and to take in part of the scientific committee. Thanks a lot, Dr. Bob Henry, former president of the WAVA, who conducted the meeting with me and also took part of the scientific committee. I also appreciate the effort of the students who worked very hard in all steps of this project making this meeting possible. Thanks, Dr. Fred Sinovac, for publishing our presentation in, in the AHI. And I cannot forget to thank all the attendants who participate in the discussion with clever questions for the presenters. And finally, I think this meeting left important message for us. Together we are stronger and get better ideas because my problems might be your too. And it also shows that we can meet and share our experiences, including scientific research for home. And of course, we we were forced to do this in this way at this time, but this for free meeting would keep us in touch while we cannot have a regular face-to-face -face congress. We can surely repeat this kind of event if you need. And finally, for the ones who are not WAVA members yet, uh, think about making our, your registration in the WAVA or in another association of veterinary anatomists because it's very important to keep in touch. Thank you very much and hope to see you all soon, maybe presently. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Marco. That was very good. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark, and congratulations again. Okay. Yes. You are welcome. Well done. Thank you, all of you. Then we can we can stay here to take a. a